very happy to have Starfire Tour back with us again. Starfire has been a guest on Dreamland. Uh, she was a terrific on Coast to Coast last November. Uh, she was a one of the presenters at the Dreamland Stargate at Joshua Tree in October. Uh, she has become a close friend after plunging me and Anne into a number of completely verifiable time slip experiences simply by the virtue of being around her and listening to her talk about these things. I think that what, I'm not quite sure. I've never been sure exactly what happened, why it was that they began to happen after we met her or did we n begin to notice them for the first time. And it's probably a mixture of both. In any case, today we're not going to be talking so much about the experiences of Whitley and Ann Strieber with Starfire Tour, but rather... I don't know if you've noticed this. I certainly have. But all of a sudden, there are a lot of people coming out of the woodwork claiming experiences as time travelers, most of which refer back in one way or another to the legendary Philadelphia experiment. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit with Starfire Tour about the Philadelphia experiment and just what is legend and what is not. And we're going to be asking ourselves a larger question. Why at this particular time would time travel suddenly become so interesting? Because the closer you get to a moment when time travel does become generally possible or generally understood, the more the presence of time travelers in the world comes into focus. Is that happening now, Starfire Tour's website is starfiretour.com. She's also got a very big presence on Facebook, but if you want to become her Facebook friend, you better hurry because she's up close to 4,000 Facebook friends and 5,000 is the limit. So run over there if you want to do that. In any case, starfiretour.com is a very cool website to visit. Welcome to Dreamland, Starfire. Thank you, Whitley. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, and we got to talking the other day, and I don't know, it, it, Starfire, how much you can say about that uh, uh, videotaping that we did, it, 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 whether it's confidential or not, just let me know, but you, if you can tell us a little bit about what we were videotaping, that would be great. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to share that along with Whitley and Ann Streber, um, the Discovery Channel has a new TV series out. Uh, it's about time travel and time shifts and time slips. And in one of their episodes, uh, they are featuring the Magic Castle time slip experience that Whitley and Ann Streber and I had and that Brandon Scott helped me to investigate. So uh, if you, in fact, if you go to my website, you'll be able to not only read the field investigation of the Magic Castle time slip and Whitley and Ann's original 2006 um, reports on it, but you'll now be able to see uh, photographs from the Discovery Channel uh, shoot. So have fun. Well, Starfire, yeah, that was a, it was a very extraordinary experience, one which I, of course, initially had no idea was extraordinary until I, what happened, folks, for those of you who don't know, was really very simple. The Magic Castle in Los Angeles is a wonderful local institution, a big old mansion full of all kinds of secret passages and so forth, uh, in which, uh, which is a club for the local, for local magician. And they bring their friends there and they, have magic shows every night. It's quite an active and wonderful place, very special. We were there for the first time with Brandon, who is a magician and Starfire, and we were going to watch his magic show. And Annie and Starfire went into the ladies' room, and I decided to wait in case Annie came out first because the place was so complicated. I was afraid if she went looking for me, she'd get lost uh, before the show, and so I wanted her to be right there so she would see me. And she came out, and another woman came out immediately behind her. A few seconds later, Starfire came out, and uh, Annie was perplexed at the presence of this other woman. And I wasn't because I didn't know that there hadn't been anybody else in this tiny ladies' room except the two of them, and 
they had this woman seemed to have kind of appeared out of nowhere and interestingly enough uh, they later starfire proved that she couldn't have been in there when Ann and she and Ann went in because there was no room for her there, there was nowhere where for her to be hidden and there were no secret entrances or anything um so uh, then it, it was one of these strange time slips and Starfire, I saw another one that I sent you a video of. Uh, now, I'll put a link up to this video on the Dreamland homepage when, during the interview, so folks, you can look at it, too. It's of a truck. This now, I taste it. Starfire hasn't investigated this yet, but I just want your thoughts about it. Assuming, let's assume, let's say, we know it could be a hoax. The video could be a hoax. We know right. that. And it's going to be very difficult to investigate because it happened in some kind of a tunnel in france and um we but assuming it isn't a hoax what the video shows is a truck going down the tunnel apparently from some kind of a security camera in the tunnel and suddenly the truck takes a tumble but another identical truck seems to come out of the wall and knock it over and they both crash uh right now now, yes it may be a video hoax but it illustrates Something very interesting about time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about about what that is, Starfire? Right. Well, if this particular video is what you see is what you get, then what we are seeing is two trucks, two very either the exact same truck or two very similar trucks trying to occupy the same space at the same time. And they are deflected from each other and both of them are crashing. Now, as I told Whitley privately, um, the way that this needs to be investigated, and if anyone who's listening would like to participate in this investigation, please get in touch with Whitley and myself. Um, first, of course, viewing the video, we want to know if there are any artifacts there that would tell us that the video has been manipulated. Um, any manipulation would tend to say that this is not a real video. Um, number two, uh, if this is taking place in a French tunnel, we want to know which one. We want to see a map and other video of the tunnel to see if there is some sort of on-ramp just out of range of the video cam where that right-hand truck might have just come into the tunnel and that's how it crashed. So, if anybody would like to help with this, please do. It is intriguing. And if it's the real deal, that is a time shift created time slip that would be very similar to what we experienced at the Magic Castle time slip. Yeah, with, the diff- with the difference it, it, that we didn't have a wreck. You almost did. Well, yes, that's right. The woman and I had a near collision. And uh, even though it didn't frighten me, it certainly concerned me. I did not want to touch this woman. I didn't know what it was, where she came from, but I was very aware that there were properties in motion that might be catastrophic if we connected. So we didn't. Now, if you, so hadn't, this, if you hadn't been there, Anne and I would never have known the time slip had happened. It, it, she might no. I take it back. And you, and you, someone had come, realized the woman coming out behind her shouldn't have been there. I didn't because I had no way of knowing that. I was just standing outside. I, I my assumption was she'd been in the bathroom when you guys went in. Uh, you were just an observer, just thinking that nothing special was going on. You were right. watching your from the top of the staircase, and I would not even have remembered what happened with the suddenly appearing mystery woman in the ladies' room had Anne not approached me as I left through the door and said, a lady came out. She didn't go in. Yeah. And what Anne was, so was the one who noticed this. <laughs> That's exactly. I mean, the Discovery Channel asked me, well, how would you wrap up your adventure in one sentence? And I said, well, when the evening began, we were all in one timeline. And at the end of the evening, we were all in another timeline. Now, and that's how time slips work. What happens Amazing. to the timelines? We've moved from one time, we moved then from one timeline to another. What happened in the timeline we left? 
Well, that's a sort of a tricky question mark because the science involved in a time slip, you know, there's not just one type of time slip. A time slip merely means that two or more coexisting timelines have merged in such a way that there is a level of consciousness on the part of the human experiencer or observer. So someone can have a time slip by suddenly finding themselves in another time period, and then they return, or maybe they don't return. There are a number of missing people cases with big question marks on them as to where they went. Um, the type of time mm -hmm. slip that we all experienced is the merging of two separate um, coexisting timelines of the same time period. So they're almost exact models with a slight variation, and that variation was, uh, at its most simplistic, the time that Anne and I went into the ladies' room and the time that the mystery woman went into the ladies' room. There was a time crunch when the two timelines were merged, and um, the effect is what we all now know as the Magic Castle time slip. Yeah, the mystery woman, folks, incidentally, turned out to not be a mystery. She was mm -hmm. working that night at the castle as a, as a photographer. We found her a few minutes later. Uh, right. What did she say, Starfire? I forgot. Well, um, I have a way of interviewing people who have experienced an, an anomaly without front-loading them or tipping them off to what I really want. So I needed to confirm in front of you and Brandon and Anne that we had actually had this near collision in the ladies' room because up until that point, it was just my word. And all we knew was that a lady had come out right after Anne, but before me, and she was not witnessed going in. And by the way, that ladies' room door has a type of a hinge on it that it inches its way closed very slowly. So even if Anne, who was standing guard at that door, had somehow blinked or missed the woman going in, she would have seen the door was ajar for quite some time and probably the lady standing within, and none of that ever happened. Well, we, we, so remember, we, I, were, we were talking outside the ladies' room for a few minutes before you guys even went in, and there was no evidence of anyone. I mean, if she, she had been in there for a while, if she was already in there, which she could not have been, uh, she was as not. We, we discovered, Starfire will be back in just a moment. Subscribers, there's an offer that may be of interest to you. If you're among the first 25 people to sign up for the Dreamland Festival, you'll get a copy of the 2009 Dreamland Festival DVD for free. It's always wise to sign up for the festival sooner rather than later because it does sell out, but this gives you a particularly good incentive to do so right away. Today we're talking with Starfire Tour, her website, starfiretour.com. She's also on Facebook, and if you want to join her on Facebook, you better hurry because uh, I noticed her Facebook page is nearly filled up. Uh, it's a fun page, too. There's a reason that a lot of people go there. Uh, in any case, before we left the air, we were talking, just finishing up, talking about the Magic Castle time slip. And uh, so, Starfire, go ahead and tell us what what she what the lady said when we when you confronted her with this right well very conversationally i said oh didn't we meet didn't we almost uh, crash into each other inside the ladies room and she admitted she said yes so this was very important that here was my other witness to this e event but i also noticed that she was a bit dazed when she was there in fact uh, I asked her if she was okay. She asked me if I was okay. We both said yes. She turned around and she walked out the door. So what was she even in there in the first place? So I asked her, yeah, I said, but, now, bear in I mind, said folks. are you sure you didn't come through a secret door? Come on. You know, you work at the Magic Castle. She swore no, that she, she, remem she remembers walking into the ladies' room through that door. This is how I know that it's a time slip. This is confirmation that she has a completely other memory of this coexisting timeline where she walked through the door. Our memory of the timeline where we were is that she never walked through that door. No. But at some point, the timelines merge, and we're all together in the yeah. common minute timeline. Now, uh, let so, me ask, go ahead. No, go ahead. that's it. You can read more about it on the website. And yeah. Of course, watch the discovery show. Right. Now, here's another question. Before I met you, 
I had had one or two spectacularly unusual experiences of shifts, one of them a clear shift back into new, into the New York of the 1870s or so, which I think my listeners yeah. are all familiar with. And if not, right. I'll just let me briefly say that on a street corner in New York, I once slipped back a hundred years in, in what turned out to be a very shocking, unforgettable experience. Um, another experience I wrote about in my book Breakthrough, which uh, where I took a turn and ended up in an entirely different reality with a little in my car with a, a little boy in the car I was taking to meet his father, and it, we eventually got out of it and came back. But Starfire, since we met you, we began to have more and more of these things, and they still happen from time to time. Is it that something is changing, or are we just noticing it because we know now what they are? What's going on? Well, first, um, I believe that you are someone who slips in and out of various uh, coexisting timelines because that's how you function. Um, uh, it's all about consciousness and brain. And Now, this could have begun with your experiences with the visitors way, way back when. Uh, or even before that, probably as a child. Uh, there's something about you that allows for not only these, these incidents to occur, but for you to consciously remember them. And that's the key. Because millions of people are actually experienced this very thing, but they don't remember. There is amnesia that veils across their brain and their memory. You don't have that market amnesia. I don't. Now, Anne does not. We know that because of the Magic Castle. And once you have your initial time slip experience, your brain forevermore is now searching for other glitches in the program. That's how it works. So when people who are mutual time slip experiencers get together, like we are, you are bound to have sooner or later, a group experience, individually or altogether, where these time slips occur. And that is exactly what happened. Now, around me, my friends will tell you that they just spend a little bit of time with me, and they begin to have these experiences too, whether or not they're with me or, or not. So this is something that I privately investigate Mm, interesting virus. <laughs> now, you have mentioned earlier in the show some cases where people have disappeared, apparently, in connection with this, which I can well believe. I, I can well believe it for two very specific reasons from personal experience. First, when I went back in time in New York on that street corner in lower Manhattan that day in March of 1983, I was, I realized after a few seconds, what had happened, and I was absolutely fascinated. And I leaned down. There was a piece of newspaper in the gutter in front of me. And right. I leaned down and started to pick it up. And as I made the motion of feeling like cold water going through my skin and through my organs of my body, was a, a very noticeable and extraordinarily disturbing and strange, but there came with it a loneliness so profound. It was like a, I thought if I feel like this for another few seconds, I'm going to go psychotic. It was mm -hmm. that powerful. And right. I just stopped. And something in me said, you touch that paper, you will stay here forever. Right. And Starfire, st you're saying to us that sometimes people do stay there forever. Is that true? Um, that is my theory. Um, I would have to actually go with them and to notate that they're there and they never came back by being able to go there and come back myself. Um, there are just a number of cases that I've investigated over the years, and both historical as well, where uh, there are a number of m missing persons, missing legions of soldiers, missing squadrons, um, missing uh, animals, missing homes. In other words, an entire home will just vanish. 
uh, a piece of a property will just vanish. These are anomalies which I investigate, and always around these cases are um, paranormal activity. There is poltergeist activity, which is objects that come and go without there being a clear reason for it. So my theory is that with all of the anecdotal stories that we have, like the one you're telling, um, of people who suddenly find themselves in uh, coexisting timelines and then they come back, there would have to be also people who have gone but did not come back. So Really fascinating and weird. And well, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just want to mention one more thing, and, and that is the importance of the Magic Castle time slip. Um, there are many, many, many anecdotal cases of time slips, many, many of them which I have investigated, which I have deemed reasonable and authentic because the person that I'm investigated is reasonable and authentic, and some of the elements of the situation is reasonable and authentic. But the Magic Castle time slip is the only repeat, the only time slip case, authentic group that has ever been experienced, investigated, and published with transparency ever. It is historical. And it also, to any scientist who is studying um, uh, multiple timelines, time travel, uh, the string theories at its most basic level, must pay attention to this flux in uh, the reality of our timelines. In San Antonio, Texas, if you go onto Divine Road and you go off onto Dick Frederick Road near the... 281 freeway, you will see on your right, moving toward the freeway, a little triangle of trees. For years, people have noticed that this little triangle of trees changes shape all the time. Anne and I used to notice it quite independently, and I mentioned it to a friend who lived nearby in Almost Park. When we lived in San Antonio, he said, oh, yeah. Everybody knows that. It happens all the time. What do you make of a thing like that? What does that mean? Uh, you are noticing uh, time shift activity where the timeline, the dominant timeline, has been taken offline. Elements have been changed. It's come back online. And you don't, we don't remember anything about this offline, online thing except we notice these changes in our reality. And these changes are not because we weren't paying attention, although your brain will want you to believe that. You know, so if, if you have a group of people who have noticed this constantly changing shape of some stationary object, you are looking at something much larger, which is time shift activity. It's Very fascinating, important. and it just, that just happens to be a sort of a marker of it. It's a marker. In yeah. fact, is all we do have are these markers. I call them glitches, glitches in the timeline program. And if those glitches weren't there, we wouldn't have a clue that any of this was going on. No, we sure wouldn't. No, we wouldn't. We're going to take another break. We're talking to Starfire Tour, her website, starfiretour.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Online. We're talking to Starfire Tour. Uh, I'm not talking to StarfireTour.com, excuse me. We are talking to Starfire Tour. Her website is StarfireTour.com about time travel, time slips, and the strangeness of time. And one of the things, one of the reasons we're talking is there has been an outburst of people claiming time travel experiences, and very often. These claims lead back in one way or another to the Philadelphia experiment. Starfire, you've done some quite interesting research on the Philadelphia experiment. Why don't you tell us what it was and what your research has turned up? Great. 
Uh, well, the first thing I want to say is that as I share this information, uh, that I'm someone who absolutely believes that time travel is a probability. And, uh, in fact, I myself have been approached on a number of times by people who not only have said, oh, I'm a time traveler, but every once in a while, one or two of them does something that really makes me think, perhaps. But because we have these constantly altering timelines, and there are multiple timelines, time travel is probable. And for anyone who actually wants to know about time travel, it is absolutely essential that you are working with fact and not fiction. And you have to wonder, well, how does somebody be able to tell the difference between somebody telling a story if it's authentic or if it's not authentic, if it's disinformation or correct information. So I would like to share information about the um, experiment um, to show that it's a hoax and that faith in the Philadelphia experiment should be completely removed as evidence of time travel and that anyone who is claiming that they were part of the Philadelphia experiment, well, they have to be looked at with some suspicion. And if anyone is associated with something that was an extension of the Philadelphia experiment, again, you should look at that person with some suspicion. And if anybody is is supporting the Philadelphia experiment as being real, even if they don't ever claim being part of it, that person's credibility as having knowledge about time travel should be looked at somewhat suspiciously. And here is why. Now, the Philadelphia experiment was alleged to be this naval military experiment at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard in the USA. And sometime in 1943, um, there was a U.S. Navy destroyer called the USS Eldridge. It was a cannon class. And this particular ship was supposed to have been rendered invisible or cloaked to human observers for a very brief period of time. And uh, sometimes later on, it's been referred to as Project Rainbow. Okay. And the story also entangled Albert Einstein and his supposed success in this discovery of the unified field theory. Now, Depending on which version of the Philadelphia experiment a person is coming across, including the unified field theory, it's supposed to involve electromagnetic forces and gravity, and by extension of that, this cloaking um, device, teleportation, and ultimately time travel. Now, in the most famous account of the Philadelphia experiment, which was introduced in 1955 by a man named Morris Jessup, um, this, um, this, this Eldridge um, was, um, was caused to become invisible, to teleport to various naval shipyards, to go back in time for a very brief period of time, and then to come back to the Philadelphia Naval Yard. The problem here is that, oh, none of it happened. Oh, and I might want to add that um, there were a crew, supposedly, aboard this ill-fated ship, and the crew either was nauseous or they would vanish out of thin air, even when they were off of the boat. And some of them, so the claim goes, was even embedded into the bulkhead. Now, in 1955... Morris uh, Jessup, who was an amateur astronomer. Uh, he published a book called The Case for the UFO, and it was a book about unidentified flying objects. And in this, he postulated that if Albert Einstein could get a really good handle on his unified field theory, then we could explain the propulsion of UFOs. Now, UFOs at this time were actually in the news. You could just go back to Kenneth 
Arnold in June of 19. 19- 47 and the UFOs that he reported. You could go back to Roswell in July of 1947. You can go to the UFO flap over Washington, D.C. in 1952. So UFOs were actually had the imagination of the public. So when this man um, published his case for the UFO, it was popular. And he went around and lectured. And one day he received this communication from a man named Allende, who claimed, and then here is where the story of the Philadelphia experiment unfolded. Right then, right there, not one moment before 1955. Okay, keep keep that in mind. Now, how can anyone know whether any of this is true? So many people have uh, come along afterward and said they were part of it, they know everything about it, they've explained the science, movies were made about it, it's referred to in TV shows and TV series and documentaries. Well, that's all well and fine. And by the way, I myself was very intrigued by it, very drawn to it. But I had to know. I research time travel. I research time shifts and time slips. And I have to know Can I rely on the Philadelphia experiment as proof of what the United States is up to in the military with time travel and teleportation? So what would I do? I decided I was going to find out what became of the USS Eldridge. If I could track that boat, maybe I could find some proof of what it had been up to. And what I discovered about the Eldridge, the DE-173, was that it was commissioned in 1943. It was in New York, never ever was in Philadelphia in 1943. And when it was decommissioned, along with three other sister ships, it was transferred over to the country of Greece. On my website, I have the documents and the photographs from 1951 of the Eldridge going into the Greek Navy. Now, remember, the very first we ever heard about the Philadelphia Experiment was 1955. So I have documents from 1951. So the question here is, common sense, would the Eldridge have been sent off to a foreign country if it was ever involved in what was claimed the Philadelphia experiment was. And common sense tells you, no. If the Eldridge had been involved in teleporting, in in the crew being embedded into the bulkhead, would this ship ever have left the property, the, the hands, the ownership of the United States? And the answer is no. So, The Eldridge, who was transferred to Greece along with the USS Slater, the USS Ebert, and the USS Garfield Thomas, all served in the Greek Navy from 1951 to either 1991 or 1992. And the Eldridge, in fact, was decommissioned from the Greek Navy in 1992 and went for scrap. It was actually sold in 1999 for scrap to a company. You can find out all this information on my website. But what about Project Rainbow uh, that so many claim was the secret name of the Philadelphia Experiment? Well, if there's no Philadelphia Experiment, there's no Project Rainbow. There were rainbow projects in the military. In fact, the the plans uh, during World War II, there was a, a Project Rainbow, but it had nothing to do with time travel. Um, some thought that, well, somebody mistook the degaussing of the Eldridge force being um, geared up for this um, uh, cloaking and uh, time travel. And, yeah, because you know, the, there, were, awesome. there were efforts made using mag- magnetism to, uh, to make ships proof, proof against mines, magnetic mines, by creating... Absolutely. Yeah. But Ab- go ahead. Go absolutely. Ahead. Yeah, the the um Starfire, we're going process. to have to we're going to have to take another short break here. We'll be right back. <laughs> 
You're listening to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. This is the edge of the world. This is Whitley Strieber. We're talking to Starfire Tour about time slips, time travel, and right now about whether or not the Philadelphia experiment even happened. Starfire, let's continue. It's fascinating listening. Well, we're talking about the degaussing process, and uh, this is something uh, which is very important to, to ship safety. Um, it is a process uh, in which a system of electrical cables are literally installed around the circumference of a ship's hull, and it runs from the bow to the stern and on both sides, and, um, and a very measured electrical current is passed through these cables, and what this does is it cancels out the ship's magnetic field. Well, why would this be necessary? Well, when you do this uh, in the hull of Navy, uh, Navy ships, um, they could avoid having magnetic mines attached to the hull. It, it saves the ship from being blown up by these magnetic mines, particularly in shallow combat waters. Um, so um, I suppose if you really wanted to stress, stretch it, you could say that the degaussing would make a ship invisible to these magnetic mines, but I don't prefer to stretch it. Um, I just prefer that people understand that the Philadelphia experiment did not happen, um, and please, please, please dismiss the Philadelphia experiment, people who attach themselves to the Philadelphia experiment, and let's move forward with really discovering what is going on with time travel and our world, uh, the editing of timelines and our world, and all the time slips and paranormal phenomenon, which are also much of which is connected to time slips. Yeah, you're going to get some you're gonna get some arguments about this, I'm, boy. I'm going to get some very, in fact, the, the most Angry emails that I've ever gotten in my life has been when people have gone to my website and looked at the evidence. They don't want to hear it. Right. They well, it's so such a fun thing to think about. I'm, I'm, I apologize for being the messenger, but really, this is about truth. I do believe that time travel, you know, we can find the evidence for it. I already have proven that we live in a world of multiple timelines. The timelines alter. Something is doing that, or someone is doing that. It could be, uh, time travelers could be involved, and I say could be involved, or it also could be a combination of a natural process that is involved. And I'm just asking for the world to move forward to re to release the Philadelphia experiment as a critical mass moment in time travel history and uh, move forward. And no, please, what does that, me the hate. Oh, no, go ahead. What does that mean for the Montauk Project, then? They seem to be connected. Is that also well, a hoax, do you think? It could be. I, I have to tell you that when I first heard about the Montauk Project many years ago, I went out to Long Island. This was before the Internet. And I did right. research in the Long Island newspaper. I, I, I've forgotten its name now. It's been many, many years. Because it was said in the book I read about it that children had been taken from all over Long Island and, and used in this experiment. And they'd been taken off the streets and so on and so forth. And I thought to myself, you know, back in the 50s, Long Island was not a big place. There, you know, there were people there, but not in the millions like there are now. Okay. And well, yeah. there would have to be stories. It would have been a huge sensation if even one child had disappeared. I okay. couldn't find a single story about it in any of those papers. I, ro I rolled through about five or six years from, I think, 1950 to 1957 or six or seven. Never a story. Oh. All right. Um, now that you've asked me that direct question, let me just say that when it comes to time travel disinformation, it can be either from willful intent or well-intentioned ignorance. Um, either way, it's extremely harmful. Montauk, those who have put out the story of Montauk, 
um, they do say that they are an extension of the Philadelphia experiment. So right then, you have to question, you know, what these so-called experiencers of Montauk are saying. Um, I think that there are a group of people who are very drawn toward the idea of experiments done on children and time travel because, in fact, such may have occurred. I think that we need to look further into um, uh, uh, some other programs that have not been um, promoted, uh, some of which I've been investigating for years. Whitley, you know, you yourself have wondered about this um, school of children yes. that you have a memory of and you've been trying to track down. Uh, yeah, I tracked down a couple of them, but they were unfortunately very, very reticent about it, about right. talking about it, oh, I mean. Right. So I, I, I do think that there are groups of people who are grown today that as children have had very unusual experiences. And I think that without the right guidance, I think that some of these people have glommed on to certain ideas attached to the Philadelphia experiment because it made them feel like they had found something that felt right and that it felt like home. But what I'm suggesting is that they've made a wrong turn and that their feelings are genuine, but they've attached those feelings to something which is disinformation. Yes. I have great, yeah, I, I have great big questions about Montauk. I do not, personally, I do not believe that what has been claimed about Montauk ever happened. But it does not mean that some aspect of what has been talked about may have occurred, just not at Montauk and probably not those people. Yeah, I went out to the old Nike base that, that they talked about, which was still there at that time. I don't know if it is now, but 20 years ago it was. And uh, there was no evidence of any underground activity at all there. Nothing well, that I could find. It, right. I mean, there are many excuses that could be made for why it's not there now. But people who understand the military a little more and how the bases work would understand that nothing like that Ever. Not, not, not only was it not done at Montauk, Montauk would not have been chosen. And there are great reasons why that is. Um, and there are many other time travel, you know, claims. And I'm just asking people to revisit, revisit these claims. How many of them attach themselves to the Philadelphia experiment? And please, re, revisit. Don't give up your attraction toward time travel, your attraction to multiple timelines. Stay with that. But if you if you get rid of the Philadelphia experiment and understand why it was you were so attracted to it, then you can move forward with genuine and authentic information. Which gets me to my next question, Starfire. Have you ever met a time traveler? It's possible. Um, naturally, in, in my line of research, I certainly get a lot of contact from people who claim to be time travelers, and I, I have a lot of people who want to know my opinion of other people who claim to be, but every once in a while, I have met someone who can perform various acts that would have told me that they had information about timelines, uh, future dates that actually came to pass. And that's a person that I would say I want to know more. But to this point, no one has ever approached me. No one has ever contacted me and proven to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that they could physically time travel. Now, I'm not talking about temporal time travel. I'm talking about physically can control by some means or another, can move 
from coexisting timeline to coexisting timeline, whether it's our perceived future, same timeline, or the past. But I would love to meet that person. I invite any authentic time traveler to contact me. How, contact how would you me. tell if they were authentic or not? I have a criteria which I will not publicly I will not publicly share, but I have a criteria that I have developed that if they can fulfill this criteria, I will know that they are authentic. And it's also possible that such an, an authentic time traveler may not want their presence known. I'll understand, and I will remain silent. But here is something that I also want people to know, and, and here is my philosophy. At some time in the past, present, or future, and some coexisting timeline, time travel was most likely perfected. Therefore, we either have time travelers here now, or they have been here and will be here again. That's just common sense. Last question. So, you mm -hmm. said, oh no, you said just a moment ago that uh, under certain circumstances, you would, if you knew about a time traveler and asked, were asked to remain silent, you would remain silent. Are you remaining silent now no, about anything? I'm not. You're not. I'm being okay. very honest. Um, In other of words, all the... you're not concealing from us. No. Okay. All I'm, right, so I'm you, not holding you... back a secret, but I am also not revealing um, the research that I've done with these people um, to test them out. And so far, no one has passed my criteria. I'm very, very tough about this. Yeah, I, mean, I definitely wouldn't l want to make a false claim in your no. court. <laughs> I know you too no. well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, now, I can make mistakes. Of course, you know, everyone if, can. You know, but any time if in my research I've been wrong, I will come right out and say, I now have more information about such and such, and I am changing my opinion. But so far, no. No. Starfire Tours Nothing website. on the Philadelphia Oh, go ahead, go nothing ahead. on anything that any supposed time travelers told me, and nothing about any publicly claimed time traveler that I would uh, be excited about. So you, nope. you, none of the people who have come forward recently with public claims feel authentic to you? None of them uh, pass my criteria, and um, basically, uh, particularly on what the adventures that they share – this in no way passes authentic criteria. Uh, I'm just not going to mention names. I, no, I don't of course think not. Fair. I, I don't think that's no, fair. There have been a number of them lately. It's been kind of strange that, you know, we've gotten, we've interviewed a couple of people, and uh, there have been many other interview requests for people claiming to be time travelers, which is uh, oh, sure. odd. I mean, sure. well, it's, what's odd about it is that before a year ago or six months ago, you never had any. Now they're there all of a sudden. Well, you know, I want to give those public proclaimers the opportunity to, you know, to prove them to prove themselves. So that's why I don't want to I don't want to make pronouncements, but I would very much like it if authentic time travelers, a experiencers or the actual people who can traverse time the people who can do it in whatever fashion they can do it. Um, I I want them to come to me. I think they can see that I'm someone who would appreciate and understand. And if they – and I hope that I can talk them into um, revealing themselves. And I'll tell you right now, Whitley, you would be the person that I would talk to, and it would be your show that I would announce this on. Well, it would be very exciting. Let's hope it happens. <laughs> Well, you know what? We are putting it out there. This is the challenge. And it's being broadcast. And that means that it can be picked up in a number of multiple timelines. It can be picked up in space, I'm assuming, at some point in time. So the challenge is out there. I can understand. I can appreciate. I can protect. But I also think that the time has come to tell the truth and... You know, I am someone in my investigation of time shifts in the core matrix, I already know that there is no grandfather paradox. 
So I already know that somebody saying to me, well, they can't come and talk to you because they're going to change the timeline. I already know that the science works in a whole other way. So that can't be pulled on me. A time traveler can absolutely come to me, can appear immediately, show me the science, take me there, prove it, and it's not going to mess up anything in our world because that's already happened. That's already out of the box. The horse has left the barn. Our our world is so interwoven with the editing of timelines that that our world is, I would say, a timeline myth. <laughs> and on that note, if you want to make real sense of this, go to StarfireTour.com. Go to her Facebook page. Get involved. The more you are involved, the more you notice time slips. And I can tell you from my own experience, they are quite, quite real. Starfire Tour, thank you very much for being with us on Dreamland. This is Whitley Strieber's Dreamland. Next up, Linda Moulton Howe. One reporter who loves mysteries is radio's leading science journalist, Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award-winning TV producer, documentary filmmaker, and the reporter and editor for EarthFiles.com, the Internet's most respected edge science website. Today, she has a report for us on a remarkable event at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thanks a lot, Whitley. I recently received the following email from a Southern California resident who follows my work in Earth Files and on radio. It says from Steve, in quotes, subject, UFO incident at U.S. Air Force, Air Force Base, 1969, close encounter of the second kind. And the date of his email is February 25, 2010. Hello, Linda. I have info on a UFO occurrence at a large Air Force base in Central California while I was on active duty there. If you are interested, let me know. Thanks, Steve, in Southern California. I did call him, and I learned that Steve was born and raised in San Diego, California, where he graduated from high school in 1966 and went right into the U.S. Air Force. After basic training and security police duties, he was first assigned to Kunsan, Korea for 18 months, followed by a tour of duty at Vandenberg Air Force Base near Santa Maria, California, that is northwest of Santa Barbara. That duty began July 1966 to July 1970. Steve told me that since his several, he and several other U.S. Air Force security policemen's encounter with an otherworldly aerial machine that they all watched emit a blue-green beam down onto a C-5 at Vandenberg. He has never talked to anyone about the experience because at the time in 1969, he was ordered by a United States Air Force Office of Special Investigations colonel, quote, you did not see anything. Close quote. But now at age 60, he says all humans deserve the truth and agreed to talk with me in a recorded phone interview, quote, because I think overall the people have a right to know more than what the government is just keeping to themselves, close quote. Here now is Steve about Vandenberg Air Force Base 1969. We got orders over the radio to meet with a uh, incoming C-5 Galaxy transport plane that was due to arrive, I believe it was around 9 o'clock at night at the air base, and we were to meet up with it to provide additional security for it. For some reason, they assigned the priority of this jet coming in. They, they considered it a hot cargo. When you get a call that you got a hot cargo coming in, that's something pretty important that they need security for. We saw the plane land. It came up to where it was assigned to be parked on the tarmac. We went over there after the plane uh, secured, and we met up with the onboard security police personnel. They had four or five security police officers with the plane guarding whatever the cargo was. 
So they invited us to come into the plane, because this was a brand new C-5 Galaxy just came out and was just flying in the Air Force, and it was a gigantic military plane. Mm -hmm. So we went over and went inside, and we looked around, and they showed us a few things, how massive the plane was and what the flight control looked like and so forth. And I noticed while I was in there that the only cargo that was in the plane was two wooden crates that weren't real big. They might have been about three feet high and about ten feet long. They were stacked on top of each other. There was nothing else in the whole plane, it's just these two crates. And after they showed us around for a few more minutes, we went back outside. And we were outside for about maybe a minute or two. Then all of a sudden, we noticed dropping down from the sky was this craft that had absolutely no sound to it. It came straight down, and I would guess that it was about 500 yards away from us at about 300 feet, and it just sat there. What was the shape and color? Well, the shape of it was hard to determine. The only thing you could definitely make out was two orangey-red glowing sort of like lights that were on opposite sides of each other. Maybe they could have been a few hundred feet apart. Then it went up into almost like a wishbone shape, had a spear at the top of it. You could make that out. It looked to be some type of silvery alloy material it was made out of. What time of day or night would this have been? This was now getting to be around 9.30 or quarter to 10 at night. Dark sky? Yeah, it was a cloudless night. It was very dark. There was really no moon out or anything. Was the very first thing that you saw coming down from the sky, the red-orange lights separated from each other? Yeah, but they seemed to be attached to a frame that went vertically up into the sky. It came down about how close? Maybe three, 400 feet off the runway, about that height. And it must have been at least 500 to six, 700 yards away. Were you seeing enough in reflected light to get a sense of the size? You know, right now in my mind, I can see it clearly. It was probably eight, 900 feet in length vertically going up. And going across, it might have been three, 400 feet. When you say vertically, do you mean that it has layers that are going up 700 or 800 feet? I would say it would have layers that went up seven to 800 feet. It was pretty good size. From those two glowing red lights, the distance between them, viewing it from the ground, it looked to be anywhere from three to 400, maybe 500 feet between the two orbs of light. How far from where you're standing to the closest point on whatever this craft is? Well, I'm using the main runway. It was situated right over the main runway. And the main runway from the tarmac and the parking area where the jet was, was a good, uh, probably about a thousand feet from where we were standing right next to the galaxy. Is this hovering close to the runway or how much distance is there between the runway and the bottom of whatever this is? Well, it was pretty much over the runway as far as being perpendicular to it. What was the altitude of this big craft right above the runway? I would estimate it at four to 500 feet. Okay. How many of you are watching this? Well, there was the three of us plus the four, I think there was four, could have been five other security police personnel that were assigned to fly with the plane. Okay, so about nine of us. And are you all watching this and you don't hear a sound? No, it's absolutely silent. It surprised us when it came into our site. It just came straight down without any sound. The only reason we knew it was there because we could see it dropping down and then it stabilized at about 500 feet above the ground. And what were you all saying or yelling to each other? Nothing, nothing. We were all just totally in awe that we didn't... I don't remember saying anything while we were watching it to anybody. I don't remember hearing anybody talking to anybody else. We were all just stunned by it. You see something that totally is so uncharacteristic of anything you, you normally see, just to appear right in front of you is pretty astounding. So what did happen? Okay, from that point, it was in its hover position. It 
turned on a, a beam of light that shined onto the plane itself. It didn't shine on us. It shined into the plane, on top of the plane. The new C-5. Yes, it did. It directed its beam like a laser beam onto the C-5 itself, just like it was aiming it right towards the cargo bay area. And, Steve, what color was that beam and about how wide was it? Uh, the color I remember as a greenish blue, and it, the width of it, um, well, it, it wasn't much wider than the plane itself. So the plane was probably about 25 feet wide. So I'd put it at about 25 feet, the width of the beam. You know, the cargo bay itself, not the wings and so forth, but just the cargo, the fuselage of the plane. That's what I'm talking about. That's what it directed its beam on, was the fuselage, towards the middle of the C-5. And that's where those two containers were that you... Yeah, had? roughly in that area. And what happened? It shined the light on for about 10 seconds, and then the light went out completely. And then after that, within a, seemed like a few seconds, the UFO just went very quickly right back up into the sky vertically and just disappeared. And do you guys run over to the C-5 and run in to see what's happened to those two pieces of cargo? No, we didn't, but the security police that were assigned to the plane did. They went back inside. Then they came out and said that they would be leaving shortly, and it was time for us to leave as well. Did you hear whether or not they tried to look inside the containers? Did you hear anything that was anomalous about what might have happened inside of that C-5? Before the UFO showed up, we were talking, and I asked the one sergeant who was in charge of the detail, I asked him, well, where are you guys going from here? He says, we're going to Groom's Lake. Now, that's what Area 51 is called now. Right. But back then it was called Groom's Lake. He said, they're going to Groom's Lake. Well, I had no idea where that is. I said, well, where's that? He said, it's somewhere in Nevada. So I do remember him saying that. So... Whatever this hot cargo was, the next stop was over there to Groom's Lake. Did anybody ever talk to you, even in rumor, about what was in those containers that the UFO seemed to be so interested in that it put a beam of light down on this new C-5 where you all knew that there were just two containers in there? No, I, nobody ever told me uh, anything about what the contents were. We didn't have a need to know, for one thing. We were there only to provide a little additional security while the plane was on the ground. But when while this was over, we went back to our uh, headquarters because it was another 40 minutes or so before we would get off duty and another crew was to come on and take over. We reported the incident to our flight sergeant, who was a master sergeant. He took notes. That was it for the night. So we left and we got off duty. Well, the next day, I was on duty again for 4 to 12, but I was on a different assignment. I was working entry control point at one of the base entry points. And after I was on duty for about two hours, a Air Force staff car came up to where I was working the gate. And this person got out dressed in a civilian suit and came over and showed me his identification. He was a colonel from the OSI, which is Office of Special Investigation. And he's in plain clothes. And uh, he said, are you such and such? I said, yes, I am. I said, do you want to know about the UFO incident? And he just said, you didn't see anything. To make sure I understood, he said, you didn't see anything, did you? I said, no, sir, I didn't. So he turned around and he left. And that's the last I... Uh, ever had any incident with this UFO sighting. Did you talk with any of your buddies or anybody else off the record about that conversation and about what in the world was this huge thing that came into the C-5? The other two guys that were with me, I never saw them again. I don't ever remember talking to them about what we saw. I don't have any recollection of running into them again. I don't know uh, what happened with them, but I never saw them again. And the fact that the OSI officer, he didn't even want to hear my account. 
tells me he already knew what transpired. They already know what happened. So he didn't want to hear anything I had to say. He just wanted to make sure I didn't want to repeat it to anybody. And this separation of people who have had encounters in a military context was something that would fall into the category of UFOs. Yeah. It is almost like standard operating procedure, separate those eyewitnesses around the world, send them to separate bases so they won't compare notes. Yeah, that's what I thought. I thought they must have been reassigned somewhere else rather quickly. Or maybe they didn't want to cooperate with uh, the OSI. But being a very young person at the time, and this was a colonel from the OSI giving you a direct order, I wasn't about to uh, tell him, no, I want to talk about it. I went along with the program at the time. If you had said to the colonel from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, sir, why are you telling me that I didn't see what I saw? What do you think would have happened? Oh, I would have probably been uh, disciplined, if not given a uh, discharge. They made it very clear that if you don't cooperate, you're going to be dealt with severely. That was my impression. From uh, You know, you, it isn't too often that you get a colonel to come to see you from OSI. I mean, they have uh, captains and majors as well, but this was the colonel himself from this OSI. And that's the first time I ever dealt with anybody from OSI. I knew they were on the base, but I didn't have any direct contacts with them. So it was to intimidate you to keep your mouth shut? Yeah, basically. That, that's what it kind of came to. Is, uh, you didn't see anything, and if you try to talk, well, it's not going to be too good for you. What residue are you left with in thinking about our government, its policies, the OSI colonel's order that you didn't see what you saw? Well, I have to believe that it was an alien craft of uh, another world. I think it wanted to track or keep an eye on the contents of what was in that plane. It was apparent that it was something that belonged to them, and it was just tracking the plane, and also it was keeping an eye on its... Hot cargo. <laughs> it's hot cargo, yeah, basically. Uh, like I said, I, I think it's something that belonged to these alien people, and i, I got to believe that the craft that we saw was being controlled by intelligent beings, not of this world, because we have nothing and still don't have anything that could perform the way this particular craft is, especially being totally silent, making no noise whatsoever. And being so huge. Yeah, it was a pretty good size. The fact that a beam went down, and then the C-5 was checked by security, and then it went away, suggests that something was not removed but was allowed to go to Groom Lake, Area 51. Yeah, it sure seems that way. Or maybe they turned something off, or they manipulated something that was in those containers. It's hard to say what the purpose of the beam of light was for. I think overall the people have a right to know more than the government keeping it to themselves. Why do you think a policy of silence by our government and other governments would go on for so long? Well, because they've lied to us for so long, it's, it's almost impossible for them to come out and say they lied to us for 50 years now or, or even longer. And I think the government are afraid that they won't be able to control the populations. And the governments are working somehow with the aliens for whatever information they're exchanging, and the government has enough to do with that. Now they don't need the world population to be demanding that the armed forces of the world protect them from the aliens. I don't think they want that on top of what they're doing now as well. It would be too much for the government to handle. And Whitley, you and Dreamland listeners can see Steve's very good illustration of this V-shaped UFO, for lack of a better understanding, a V-shaped craft putting this greenish-blue beam down on a C-5. He used a photo of a C-5 to help with the uh, uh, clarity of the illustration. And since at least the 1960s, so many people in the human abduction and animal mutilation phenomena 
have reported seeing beams of light emitted from something in the sky that is clearly unidentified and falls into the UFO category. And they have seen and reported beams that raise plants from gardens, animals from pastures, or even people rising in a beam of light, or non-human entities being lowered in beams to the ground. And one of the cases of what appears to be an eyewitness on another military base, this is 1974 at Fort Stewart uh, down in Georgia, uh, I went into great detail on this case in my book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, because I spent a lot of time talking with this man who had been in Vietnam, had been in special forces, had tremendously responsible work in the United States Army, he is at Fort Stewart in April of 1974 on the base, and he and his wife in a car see a white light, and they, it's very bright, and it catches their attention. He does not think it's more than 300 or 400 feet above the ground. And then, after this is a quote now from his drawings to me, after the disc remained motionless for approximately two to three minutes, it shot a blue light beam from under its center. The blue beam slowly descended to the ground like an elevator. Then the top of the beam detached itself from the round object in the sky and also slowly descended to the ground like an elevator. When the top of the blue beam apparently reached the ground, and that is a little confusing because the whole beam now has, has detached itself from the UFO, so the whole beam is moving to the ground, collapsing on itself in some strange way. Uh, a pure white light beam shot up from the descending blue beam rapidly to the disk, and once the top of the white beam touched the disk, the bottom began to lift back up like an elevator. This is a complex image. The drawing helps, but inside of the blue beam that the husband and wife are watching, it appears to be a human being who is turning slowly as it is raised up into the craft. Now, this man spent a lot of time trying to report this and find out who at Fort Stewart might know about what was this object, what was the beam, and why did a human appear to be lifted up in this beam, slowly rotating. And like everything else, including the experience of Steve at Vandenberg Air Force Base in 1969. They meet walls of leave it alone, don't talk about it if you want to have a career. So, Whitley, uh, even though these are 1969 and 1974 cases, in 2010, I do not see any change in our government's policy of denial and keeping people quiet. No change at all. And just a couple of days ago, Linda, the uh, uh, RAF was videotaped chasing a UFO. And while the RAF admitted that they did have a uh, plane in the sky, they would not admit what they were doing. In other words, it's business as usual. They are still right. chasing them uh, and... I have a feeling that that pretty much gets them to react to the way we might react to Trobri and Islanders who were shaking their spears at us. Uh, we would kind of keep a hands-off policy and watch for a dist from a distance um, unless they hurt themselves trying to harm us. The question always, though, with a case like this that, th that you've just described is, what was in those boxes? Was it, was yeah. some was it something we'd taken? or something we'd given. The United States government makes its own policy on this without regard to the will of the people, as a result of which our most important relationship, the most important relationship in human history, which is mankind's relationship to people from other worlds, remains a deep, dark secret. We did not get and do not get the chance to participate in how 
we want ourselves to be seen. And that is a crime that's so great that it suggests that if any government is actually doing that, and I think they are, that's not a government. It's a criminal enterprise of a kind so terrible and so profoundly evil, it doesn't even yet have a name. And Whitley, you know, it's been clearly demonstrated by all these eyewitnesses describing this amazing and provocative beam technology that clearly does everything that we have all hoped someday we would be able to do, have energy systems that could neutralize gravity and lift and lower heavy objects. Of course, I, I've had the experience of doing that. I've been in such a beam. I've been in that. And it's incredible. It's faster than an elevator. It takes the stomach right out of you. So the, the degree to which it affects gravity, I don't know. In other words, it may be overcoming gravity without neutralizing it at all, because you do feel a sense of rising very, very quickly when you're in that beam. Uh, and I'm not the only Close Encounter witness who has described this experience. Linda, it's been <laughs> provocative to say the going down the tunnel, apparently from some kind of a security camera in the tunnel, and suddenly the truck takes a tumble, but another identical truck seems to come out of the wall and knock it over, and they both crash. Uh, right. Now, now it, yes, it may be a video hoax, but it illustrates something very interesting about time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about about what that is, Starfire. Right. Well, if this particular video is what you see is what you get, then what we are seeing is two trucks, two very, either the exact same truck or two very similar trucks trying to occupy the same space at the same time. And they are deflected from each other, and both of them are crashing. Now, as I told Whitley privately, um, the way that this needs to be investigated, and if anyone who's listening would like to participate in this investigation, please get in touch with Whitley and myself. Um, first, of course, viewing the video, we want to know if there are any artifacts there that would tell us that the video has been manipulated. Um, any manipulation would tend to say that this is not a real video. Um, Number two, uh, if this is taking place in a French tunnel, we want to know which one. Very happy to have Starfire Tour back with us again. Starfire has been a guest on Dreamland. Uh, she was a terrific on Coast to Coast last November. Uh, she was a, one of the presenters at the Dreamland Stargate at Joshua Tree in October. Uh, she has become a close friend after plunging me and Anne into a number of completely verifiable time slip experiences simply by the virtue of being around her and listening to her talk about these things. I think that what, I'm not quite sure. I've never been sure exactly what happened, why it was that they began to happen after we met her or did we n begin to notice them for the first time. And it's probably a mixture of both. In any case, today we're not going to be talking so much about the experiences of Whitley and Ann Strieber with Starfire Tour, but rather, I don't know if you've noticed this, I certainly have, but all of a sudden there are a lot of people coming out of the woodwork claiming experiences as time travelers, most of which refer back in one way or another to the legendary Philadelphia experiment. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit with Starfire Tour about the Philadelphia experiment and just what is legend and what is not. And we're going to be asking ourselves a larger question. Why at this particular time would time travel suddenly become so interesting? Because the closer you get to a moment when time travel does become generally possible or generally understood, the more the presence of time travelers in the world comes into focus. Is that happening now? Starfire Tour's website is starfiretour.com. She's also got a very big presence on Facebook, but if you want to become her Facebook friend, you'd better hurry because she's up close to 4,000 Facebook friends and 5,000 is the limit. So run over there if you want to do that. In any case, starfiretour.com. 
is a very cool website to visit. Welcome to Dreamland, Starfire. Thank you, Whitley. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, and we got to talking the other day, and I don't know, it, it, Starfire, how much you can say about that uh, uh, videotaping that we did, it, 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 whether it's confidential or not, just let me know. But you, if you can tell us a little bit about what we were videotaping, that would be great. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to share that along with Whitley and Ann Streber, um, the Discovery Channel has a new TV series out. Uh, it's about time travel and time shifts and time slips. And in one of their episodes... She'd get lost uh, before the show, and so I wanted her to be right there so she would see me. And she came out, and another woman came out immediately behind her. A few seconds later, Starfire came out, and uh, Annie was perplexed at the presence of this other woman. And I wasn't, because I didn't know that there hadn't been anybody else in this tiny ladies' room, except the two of them, and... They had, this woman seemed to have kind of appeared out of nowhere. And interestingly enough, uh, they, they later Starfire proved that she couldn't have been in there when Anne and, she and Anne went in because there was no room for her. There, there was no where, where for her to be hidden. And there were no secret entrances or anything. Um, so uh, then it, it was one of these strange time slips. And Starfire, I saw another one that I sent you a video of, uh, and I'll put a link up to this video on the Dreamland homepage when, during the interview, so folks, you can look at it too. It's of a truck, and this now, I taste and add, Starfire hasn't investigated this yet, but I just want your thoughts about it, assuming, let's assume, let's say, we know it could be a hoax, the video could be a hoax. We know right. that, and it, it's going to be very difficult to investigate, because it happened in some kind of a tunnel in france and um we but assuming it isn't a hoax what the video shows is a truck uh, they are featuring the magic castle time slip experience that whitley and ann streber and i had and that brandon scott helped me to investigate so uh if you in fact if you go to my website you'll be able to not only read the field investigation of the Magic Castle Time Slip and Whitley and Ann's original 2006 um, reports on it. But you'll now be able to see uh, photographs from the Discovery Channel uh, shoot. So have fun. <laughs> well, Starfire, yeah, that was a, it was a very extraordinary experience, one which I, of course, initially had no idea was extraordinary until... I, what happened, folks, for those of you who don't know, was really very simple. The Magic Castle in Los Angeles is a wonderful local institution, a big old mansion full of all kinds of secret passages and so forth, uh, in which, uh, which is a club for the local, for local magician. And they bring their friends there and they have magic shows every night. It's quite an active and wonderful place, very special. We were there for the first time with Brandon, who is a magician and Starfire, and we were going to watch his magic show. And Annie and Starfire went into the ladies' room, and I decided to wait in case Annie came out first because the place was so complicated. I was afraid if she went looking for me, 